Okay, so let's look very briefly here at the uh, online class I teach on uh, Saturdays. Okay, so we talked about some of the history of the Moors and the Moors going into Europe. Um, and I referenced uh, Renoko Rashidi's book. We referenced uh, uh, the books uh, Black Star, the African Presence in Early Europe, and then also um, Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. Okay. Uh, this is a good article from National Geographic that we use in the class because we use books, uh, video clips. Uh, there's over 50 articles that I reference uh, in the class. It's probably about 200 slides. Who were the Moors? The Moors' ancestors were known as the Garamantes. They were a black African people living throughout North Africa. Hannibal Barca, who we talked about a couple of weeks ago, Hannibal Barca, and we dealt with the Punic Wars, and we dealt with the Battle of Cannae, 216 BC. We dealt, we dealt with in 219 uh, BC, uh, Hannibal crossing the Alps with the, with the elephants to uh, stomp the Russian army. We dealt with 216 BC, the Battle of Cannae, where uh, Hannibal was outnumbered by the, uh, by the Roman army, and he defeats about, uh, they, they kill about 70,000 Roman soldiers in one day. And then we deal with, we talk about the Battle of Zama, 202 BC, where Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus defeats Hannibal Barca at the Battle of Zama in 202 BC, right? We know that uh, Carthage is going to be destroyed in, in uh, about 143 BC or so. Carthage is going to be destroyed. Now, the Moors' ancestors were the Garamantes. They were a black African people living throughout North Africa. Hannibal Barca was Garamanti. The um, the Carthaginians are descendants of the Phoenicians, right? And Carthage is is in the area where you have uh, Tunisia today in North Africa, as well as St. Augustine was Garamanti also. Now, the Moors, according to George G.M. James in his book, Stolen Legacy, and I had the book here on one of these stacks of books, uh, George G.M. James in Stolen Legacy, uh, he said that the Moors were the custodians of the ancient Egyptian mystery system. These teachings are going to bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. These teachings are going to bring Europe out of the Dark Ages is going to be to the detriment of, of African people because every that we taught Europeans came back to kick us in the behind. Everything that we taught them, the science, the mathematics, the nautical instruments, the algebra, the, uh, the alchemy or uh, what we call chemistry, the periodic tables, uh, the fire stick that's introduced, which is a long stick that fired one projectile. The In Europe, they're going to produce first uh, firearm in mid 14th century AD, some 1346, 1356. Uh, but that's based upon the technology that the, that the Moors take into Europe. Okay, now the word Moor is derived from the Greek word maros, M A U R O S, which literally means black or very dark color, or a very dark color. Now, the Romans adopt this word and call them Mari, M A U R I, Mari. The Mari were a northwest African people who were very dark skinned. The Romans will refer to the region of Northwest Africa as Mauritania, M-A-U-R-I-T-A-N-I-A, -A -A, Mauritania, Mari. Mauritania is Latin and means the land of the black skinned people. You'll also hear the uh, the Roman term Marish, Marish. Now, Romans later adopt the word uh, as a reference for the black skinned inhabitants they encountered in Africa. And if you read pages five, uh, 27 and 187, The Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. Um, they break this down in the book. Also, there is an excellent essay. So Renoko Rashidi has an essay in this book. Uh, we, uh, so this is a book we reference in the class. So you don't have to buy any of these books to follow along uh, in the class. Uh, and then also we use Renoko's book, Black Star, the African Presence in Early Europe. Uh, as well, which deals with the history of the Moors in Europe also. We know Renoko Rashidi passed away August 2nd, 2021. Renoko is a friend of mine. We had him here. I think I've interviewed, interviewed him about six years over the past years, over the past 12 years, because my first interview with Renoko was in 2010. Uh, he was uh, the first year that I launched the African History Network show. So he was one of my first interviews. Also, Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay, I think he was my third interview. Dr. Leonard Jefferson was my, was my first interview, but I interviewed Dr. Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay, 10 also, and he has an essay, a fantastic essay on the history of the Moors in the book, Golden Age of the Moor. Okay, now, um, so we talk about, uh, okay, uh, of course, uh, the Moors going in 711 AD from Morocco into 
uh, the Iberian Peninsula, known as Spain and Portugal, and they're going to fight against the Valens and the Visigoths. Uh, and where they settle in southern uh, Spain, they call Al Andalus, which basically means to walk in the spiritual path or walk in the spiritual light. Al Andalus. Um, the let's see here. Variations of the word more Marino is Spanish, which means dark, dark complexion, now meaning brunette or dark hair. Mora is Spanish. Uh, originally, it referred to a, a Moorish woman, now means blackberry, the fruit, not the not the discontinued smartphone, but the fruit blackberry. They talk about this on page seven of Golden Age of the Moor. Mora is Italian, which means blackberry. Morasad is French, which means dark skin or black or black or more. And Morelan is French, which means black grape. So you see the variations of the word more in different languages. And we see the impact of the Moors in these uh, different languages as well. OK, now there's a. Um, we talk about uh, General Tariq Ibn Ziyad as well, 711 AD, and uh, he goes into the Iberian Peninsula and where they land at Rock Promontory, uh, they call it Jebel Tariq, Jebel Tariq, or Tariq's Mountain, which is Arabic, and is translated as Gibraltar, or what you call the Rock of Gibraltar. Okay, so the Rock of Gibraltar is named after an African man, General Tariq Ibn Ziyad, right, who leads the Moors into uh, the Iberian Peninsula in 711 AD. Now, if we look at this here, uh, according to the Oxford Dictionary, uh, the Moors as early as the Middle Ages and as late as the 17th century were commonly supposed to be black or very swarthy, and hence the word is often used for negro or negro. Early in the 8th century AD, after a grim and extended resistance to the Arab invasions of North Africa, the Moors joined the triumphant surge of Islam. Following this, they crossed over from Morocco over to the Iberian Peninsula, where their swift victories and remarkable feats soon became the substance of legends. In July, uh, uh, in July of 17 AD, Tarif, Tarif, with 400 foot soldiers and 100 horses, all Berbers, successfully carried out a mission in southern Iberia. Tarif, an important port city in southern Spain, is named after him. OK, then in 711 AD. So that's the reconnaissance mission to get the lay of the land in 710 AD, because you had emissaries. You had the Sephardim who were uh, Jews who converted to Christianity. They're there in Spain being persecuted by the Vandals and the Visigoths. They send emissaries into Morocco and ask the uh, Moors to come in to rescue them. And the Moors go and fight against these barbarians, the Vandals and the Visigoths and defeat them. OK, and they take control of portions of uh, what, what today we call Spain. All right. This is how the Moors get in. This is why they end up basically in uh, uh, Spain in the first place. That They should have just, um, you know, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't ask the telephone if you if you understand what happened after all that. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, you know, but yeah, hey, you know, it is what it is. But anyway. I, I can understand wanting to help people, but I'll be here. You know. uh, so we talked about St. Maurice, who became a patron saint of Germany. We broke down what are patron saints and explain the history behind patron saints. And the patron saints are going to take the place of the Netaru. In Christianity, the patron saints are going to take the place of the Netaru. OK, uh, and patron saints are saints that. Um, watch over groups of people watch over different cities uh that people pray to etc but saint maurice who was a who was a moor and a christian okay and renoko rashidi has an uh has a piece dealing with as an article for atlantablackstar.com uh dealing with uh the black saint maurice not of the holy lance saint maurice refers uh, 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 refuses to persecute um some uh christians okay and he's a more he's Christian himself and he and his army allow him to get killed. All right. So he becomes a patron saint to uh, Germany. Uh, there's a good piece on Tariq Ibn Ziyad from uh, Britannica.com, Encyclopedia Britannica. And I use Britannica. One, they have good information. Two, I have a monthly subscription to Britannica. I pay them each month and I'm trying to get my money's worth out of these subscriptions. I pay uh national geographic was it 24.99 a month i just signed up for wall street journal that's eight dollars a month 
I just signed up. I got the Los Angeles Times for a dollar for six months because uh, I got a better deal than I had with them like six months ago. Time Magazine, they want to charge me $19 a month, but I just signed up again with Time Magazine. I think I use a different email address, so I just signed up with Time Magazine. I get what am I paying them a dollar for the first month or something, something crazy like that. Um, so what I try to do is uh, try to renegotiate <laughs> the terms of the agreement after the initial uh, subscription fee. You know, they sign you up for a, a dollar for for a month, and then it goes to twenty five dollars after that, or something like that. So I try to like renegotiate. Okay. <laughs> Try to control expenses. So Tariq Ibn Ziyad, um, Britannica.com has some good information on this. Uh, Musa Ibn Nusayr, the Arab conqueror of Morocco, left his general Tariq Ibn Ziyad to govern Tangier in his place. Spain at this time was under Visigothic rule. So, so see, this gets has it to the history, right, of, of these vandals. Now, the vandals and the Visigoths crushed the uh, Western portion of the Roman Empire in 476 AD and cast Europe into what's known as the Dark Ages. The Vandals and the Visigoths, they crushed the Western portion of the Roman Empire 476 AD. All right. And uh, you, during, you're going to have this period of time of famine, uh, strife, civil war, not a lot of inventions taking place during the Dark Ages. And it's going to go from uh, fifth century AD to the uh, to the about the 1300s. OK, about the 1300s, the dark, the dark ages. So uh, Musa Ibn Nasser, the Arab conqueror of Morocco, left his general Tariq to govern Tangier in his place. Spain at this time was under Visigothic rule, but was rent by civil war. OK, they were dealing with a lot of civil war in um, Spain at this time. Now, the dispossessed sons of the recently deceased Visigothic king of Spain, Witizia, Witiza, I should say, Witiza, appealed to the Muslims for help in the civil war, okay? The dispossessed sons of the Visigothic king of Spain, Witiza, appealed to the Muslims for help in the civil war, and they quickly responded to this request in order to conquer Spain for themselves. But also, the Sephardim, the, the Sephardic Jews in Spain, they sent, sent emissaries into Morocco to ask for help from the Moors because they're being persecuted by the Vandals and the Visigoths. In May 711 AD, Tariq ibn Ziyad landed on Gibraltar, Jebel Tariq, Tariq's mountain, with an army of 7,000 men. Now, depending upon the source, the, the number of men he arrived with may vary, but he showed up with thousands of men, mostly Berbers, Syrians, and Yemenis. Gibraltar henceforth became known as Jebel Tariq, Mount Tariq, for which the anglicized form of the name is adapted, Gibraltar, okay? Um, Tariq soon advanced to the Spanish mainland itself, gaining valuable support from Spanish Jews, from Spanish Jews who had been persecuted by the Visigoths and from Christian supporters of Watiza's sons, okay, the Visigothic king. In July 711 AD, Tariq ibn Ziyad defeated the forces of the Visigothic usurper king Roderick at a undetermined location. He then immediately marched upon Tariq ibn Ziyad, then immediately marched upon Toledo, the capital of Spain, and occupied that city against little resistance. He also conquered Cordoba. Uh, uh, Musa ibn Nasser himself arrived in Spain with a force of more than 18,000 in 712 AD, common era, and together the two generals occupied more than two-thirds of the Iberian Peninsula, today called Spain and Portugal. It, in, the in, in the next few years. In 714 common era, Musa and Tariq ibn Ziyad were summoned by the caliph back to Damascus, where they were both accused of misappropriation of funds and died in obscurity. 
So we, we take you through our history. We look at this history chronologically. We deal with why there are African Moors heads on the national flags of Corsica and Sardinia. And uh, on page, right around page 90 of um, Renoko Rashidi's book, he shows this and he deals with the, uh, we also deal with the Black Madonna and Child as well, because that ties into um, Asar Aset and Heru. And even before the Moors go into uh, Europe, the uh, Europeans uh, have the statues of the Black Madonna and Child, which goes back to Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus, the first Holy Trinity. Now, this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you never heard it before, disagree with it, or don't like it, does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what it is that I'm talking about, Okay. And in various ways, and, and Sister Nubia Wartford, who's a brilliant archaeologist uh, here in uh, Detroit, or cultural, she calls herself a cultural anthropologist, she's a cultural anthropologist. She goes to the Sudan to do archaeological digs, right? She can explain this portion of it better than I can. But uh, Sister Nubia, and we've had her here on the African History Network show for a number of times throughout the years, she does presentations dealing with how the iconography iconography in the christian church has preserved african culture and the uh african spirituality coming from ancient kemet a lot of this is preserved in christianity it's just it's just not talked about a lot it's not highlighted a lot of people see these things but don't know what they're looking at right so if we look at uh right here on page uh 90 and 91 of black star the African presence in early Europe by Renoko Rashidi. He, he took pictures, you know, Renoko traveled around the world about 125, 130 countries and islands. Uh, and he shows you statues and paintings of the black Madonna child throughout Europe, uh, Switzerland. We see it in Switzerland. We see it in uh, Poland, Saskatchewan, Poland right here. This is Switzerland here, statue. We see the painting here in Poland. The Black Virgin of Madrid, Spain, this statue here, uh, Black Virgin and Child uh, statue in St. John's Church, Luxembourg, City, Luxembourg. Okay, we see the national flag of uh, uh, Sardinia, which is an Italian island with the four African Moors heads on it. We see the uh, coat of arms of Pope Benedict XVI with the head of a Moorish king, because a lot of Europeans have uh, a lot of these years because the, the the moors intermix into the european population into the bloodstream Af the african men men moors male moors were having sex with white women okay this is it is what it is uh dr john henry clark said uh black men are natural born sweet talkers wherever we go they were intermixing into the european population changing the complexion to various extents uh, of Europeans throughout where they go, especially in Spain and Portugal, because Spain and Portugal is right above, um, uh, because it's right above Morocco, they got the brunt of it, okay? Spain and Portugal got the brunt of it. Uh, it happened in England also, but to a lesser extent in England, because England was further away from um, Morocco, okay? But if we look at this here, and I'm not sure why that's flashing. But if we look at this here, we go back. Let's go to the map of uh, Alain de Luz right here. So we look at it geographically. There's just a very short distance between Morocco and Spain. So Spain and Portugal get the brunt of it. Also, Portugal is the first one involved in the transatlantic slave trade, basically 1441 Common Era A.D., with Anton, Anton Gonzalez going into Mauritania, which is a short distance from Portugal, okay? And then the Spanish are right behind. They're the second ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade. The Spanish are right behind the Portuguese. Okay, so we take you through our history. We deal with uh, this history chronologically. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips. Uh, we deal with we deal with thousands of years of history, what leads it to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We deal with the African presence uh, in the Americas going back at least 51,700 years ago. We reference work from Dr. David M. Hotel. That's one of the sources, not the only one. 
um, page 14 of his book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence, and I have that book behind me. He deals with the discovery by Dr. Albert Goodyear in Allendale County, South Carolina, 2004, 13 different types of evidence thoroughly documenting an African presence in the land we call the United States of America, going back at least 51,700 years ago. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, footprints and lava, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, um, skulls, skeletons, structures, and tools. 14, uh, they found 13 different types of evidence, thoroughly documenting an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. And we look, one of the things we do is we look at a number of different archaeological discoveries that have happened in like the last 10 or 12 years that are causing um, the archaeologists, scientists, paleontologists to totally rethink everything. And when these discoveries come, come out, it causes them to have to push the timelines back. They talk about how they keep, they, they um, have to rethink all of this, push the timelines back, uh, especially the discovery that came out in June 2017 in Morocco when they found remains of Homo sapiens dating back 300,000 to 350,000 years ago. And that pushed the timeline back because before that, the oldest uh, fossils of um, Homo sapiens, modern man, were found in Ethiopia that dated back 195,000 years ago. The discovery that came out in June 2017 in Morocco just blew all of this out of the water. Okay. This article right here is from 2004. And this is from sciencedaily.com. This is about uh, Dr. Albert Goodyear's discovery. Here's a picture of Dr. Albert Goodyear. He's an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. Uh, you can still read this article. It's still up. New evidence puts man in North America at least 50,000 years ago. November 18, 2008 from sciencedaily.com, which is a scientific website. They have different scientific discoveries there, but the other uh, news sources that uh, reported on this finding as well. Radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed um, last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County uh, by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments uh, containing these artifacts were at least 50,000 years old, meaning that uh, humans inhabited North America before the last ice age, meaning that humans inhabited North America before the last ice age. OK, so who were these humans? Who are these humans? These were the Khoisan who have the oldest DNA on the planet. Science magazine has an article uh, uh, from, from around October 2012 that talks about the Khoisan, who are the ancestors of the Anu and the Twa. They went all around the world. And they were also here in the land we call the United States of America, going back at least 51,700 years ago. An October 2012 genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the, that the Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan, formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, are genetically unique and no other currently known population had separated so easily from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. Now, here's a, a picture of a couple of Khoisan sisters, okay, a couple of Khoisan women that are short statured Africans. Now, the Khoisan live mainly in southern Africa in territories span spanning Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. They are largely divided into two groups, hunters and gatherers called the Sans people, S-A-N-S, and keepers of the livestock called the Khoi Khoi people. The, the Khoisan languages include the distinctive click sounds that are not found in the languages of their neighbors. And the click language was the original language. OK, the click language was the original language. And in the movie Black Panther, the uh, uh, language spoken in the film uh, Black Panther is Isikosa, okay, because we deal with the uh, film Black Panther, because African culture is all throughout and history is all throughout the film Black Panther, okay? I did three uh, three months of research on uh, the film Black Panther as well as the comic book to be able to do my lectures on that, uh, on the film. The Panther deity that we see in Black Panther, Bastet, or Bast, I should say Bast, the Panther deity, that comes straight out of ancient Kemet. That comes from the Netter, Bastet, 
okay, that was worshipped as early as Second Dynasty, around 2890 BCE. So Bast or Bastet was a, a was an ancient Kemetic or Egyptian goddess or Netter worshipped in the form of a lioness, and then later a cat. Uh, she was the goddess of warfare in Lower Kemet, Lower Egypt. Okay, so Bast it, it, that you see a lot of stuff that you see in the film is not made up. There were 11 different African cultures that we saw represented in the film Black Panther. Okay. Uh, uh, Ruth Carter, who was the costume designer, she researched, she spent six months researching African uh, cultures. So when we look at the Dora Malaji, right, the Dora Malaji, who were the uh, African female warriors, I think I have a slide here on the Dora Malaji, the African female warriors that we see depicted in the film Black Panther, um, they were influenced from the, um, uh, where their costume uh, comes from the Maasai, the Maasai of Kenya and Tanzania, okay? The, um, the real life inspiration for the uh, Dora Malaji are the African female warriors called the Ohosi or the Mino, okay? Um, of Dahomey, modern day Benin. And this is where th these African female warriors, this is this was the real life inspiration for the Dora Malaji. Dorma, the Dora Malaji were introduced, I think it was around 1998 in the Black Panther comic books, they were introduced. Dora Malaji means adored ones, okay? So in my, in my presentation on uh, Black Panther, and uh, we'll pull this slide up here. I'll show you this one here because we deal with the film Black Panther in the class because there's a lot of culture, African culture, history related in the film. Uh, where are we? Right here. The Dora Malaji of Wakanda come from uh, the Homey uh, Republic of Benin. Right here. Okay. So where we go right here. So they come from the Ahosi or the Mino. Now, these are the African female warriors that are depicted in the new movie coming out September 16, 2022, by, uh, starring Viola Davis, uh, called The Woman King, The Woman King. And it deals with these African female warriors who are fighting against the French colonizers. It deals with the franco dahomian Wars, okay? Uh, it, it fighting against the uh, French colonizers in the uh, late 1800s, okay? Now, uh, some people say, oh, well, the, these African female warriors, they were used to capture uh, other Africans and enslave them, things like this. That's true. African history is not perfect, just like European history is not perfect. Europeans were enslaving each other for hundreds of years. Neither one was right, but it happened. But also, these African female warriors fought against the French colonizers as well. Okay, African history, just like European history, is not perfect. Europeans were killing each other for hundreds of years, even before they came, before they became nations, when they were kingdoms. And you had the Vandals, the Visigoths, the Lombards, the Jutes, the Anglos, the Saxons, the Picts, the Alans, these Germanic people collectively called barbarians who were who were fighting and killing each other. Okay, they're fighting and killing each other, just like the, the Vandals and the Visigoths crushed the western portion uh, of the Roman Empire and cast uh cast Europe into the dark ages. Okay. Then, then they're going to, then these uh, kingdoms are going to become nations and they're going to keep fighting one another. And then they become Spain and Portugal and, and, and the Netherlands and England, uh, Great Britain, things like this, France, Germany. And then they're fighting each other and killing each other over the, over the transatlantic slave trade, control of the transatlantic slave trade over Africa, over the new lands that are being conquered, go, even going back to Christopher Columbus and his four voyages. And uh, we see that these different um, areas that Columbus is conquering fall into the hands of other people. So the French get control of the western third of the island of Hispaniola and call it St. Dominique, which becomes Haiti, where the Haitian Revolution is. OK, we, we're going to see that um, the uh, British take control of Jamaica. Because Columbus conquers Jamaica in 1494, we see the Treaty of Tordesillas um, in um, about the 15th century, the Treaty of Tordesillas, and the uh, Pope tells Spain and Portugal to stop fighting amongst yourselves and go out 
and uh, conquer these uh, uh, non-Christian people. And the Pope di divides the non-Christian world among Spain and Portugal and sends them out to conquer Spain and Portugal. Because these, these, these European nat nations who were formed originally hundreds of years prior by barbarians were fighting and killing each other. Then when they become nations, they continue to fight and kill each other. And then they have world, world wars continue to fight and to kill each other. Okay. So Germany, okay, and France and Great Britain and all this. So they go from barbarians to kingdoms to nation states to World War I, World War II. Europeans have been fighting and killing each other over a thousand years. And you have wars between different African nations and things like that also. Nobody's history is perfect. Okay. So we deal with all this history. And the second class that I teach, um, the one I teach on Sundays, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968, that class basically picks up where the first one, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, leaves off. So we pick up the second class, we pick up in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase and the Haitian Revolution. And that, and then so when you talk about the Haitian Revolution, so then you got to talk about go back to Christopher Columbus and his four voyages, because Columbus conquers Haiti. So you see how all this is connected, and Columbus set sail on his first of four voyages, August 3rd, 1492, the day after the Sephardim, the Sephardic Jews, are expelled out of Spain. And later in the same year that the uh, Moors lose control of the last stronghold, Granada, January 2nd, 1492. All this history is connected. So you can't talk about the transatlantic slave trade without talking about Cristobal Colon, Christopher Columbus. I know a lot of, I know we don't want to talk about Columbus. You, you have to talk about Columbus. A lot of this has to do with Columbus and these island nations where Columbus goes and conquers and decimates, rapes, rapes and pillages, they've never recovered from what happened. Haiti is still dealing with what happened 500, over 500 years ago, okay? Cuba. And then you have the you have the Spanish American War of 1898 and Cuba's fighting against Spain for for their independence because Spain conquered Cuba. It was Columbus that conquered Spain in 1492. These these island nations have never recovered from what these Europeans did to them. In contrary to popular belief, Columbus never comes to the land that we call the United States of America, this contiguous contiguous landmass, contiguous meaning connected. He never, uh, um, Alaska and Hawaii are not part of the contiguous United States, okay? So uh, his first voyage, August 3rd, 1492, he set sail on the Nina, the Penta, and the Santa Maria. He lands in the Bahamas, October 12th, 1492. So this is why some people celebrate uh, Columbus Day, October 12th, 1492. I celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day because there was African people in this land we call the U.S. and also in some of these other areas that he conquered, there were African people there before he even got there. So African-Americans should celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. Indigenous Peoples Day includes African-Americans also. That does not mean the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. Some people just want to claim slavery. We got to claim slavery. Are you trying to take slavery away from us? No. You need to understand a chronology of history of the last 50,000 years of history, not just the last 500 years of history. Yes, the transatlantic slave trade happened. OK, we're not take, trying to take slavery away from you. We're not trying to say, oh, African people weren't slaves because some people that's just their claim to fame slavery. No, slavery did happen. But you got to understand tens of thousands of years of history and that chronology of history before 1441. Before 1555, before 1526 and the Spanish are taking Africans into the ter territory we call Georgia and South Carolina today. 93 years before August 19th, 29, uh, August, uh, 19, uh, August 20th, 1619. That's 93 years before that. The Spanish are taking Africans into South Carolina, the territory we call South Carolina. OK, so he goes into um, uh, the Bahamas. He goes into his first voyage, Cuba. Hispaniola, his second voyage, 
September 1493 goes into the West Indies and Puerto Rico and Jamaica, 1494. All this is Spain. Okay, King Ferdinand, Queen Isabella, these, these Spanish invaders. All this is Spain doing all this treachery, killing tens of thousands of people. Actually, I'm sorry, millions of people. There's millions of people. May third voyage, May 1498, Trinidad and Venezuelan mainland. Fourth voyage and last voyage, May 1504, Panama and Honduras. So number one, Columbus never comes to the land that we call the United States of America. So please stop teaching our children. Please stop saying this in school. Columbus discovered America. It, there was already Native Americans and African people there, number one. Two, he had some Moors navigating his ships. A lot of people like Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay and Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, and Professor Kaba is one of my teachers, a lot of them don't think Columbus was lost in the first place because as, Prof as Professor Kaba says, a third grader knows that based upon where the sun rises in the, in the morning and sets in the evening, you know which direction you're going in. And he had Moors navigating his ships, uh, like the uh, Pedro Alonso Nino, the Nino brothers, things like this. So it's it's really believed by like real scholars that Columbus knew where he was going. He wasn't lost. He's using nautical instruments also based upon the technology that the Moors introduced in the year, which is another problem. Once again, this is why I say I wish we never taught them, because personally, uh, when we really study this history, look at it chronologically. The transatlantic slave trade is really Europeans getting revenge on the African Moors and what the Moors did in Europe. Uh, and because the Moors are going to Africanize various parts of Europe to various degrees, the Moors are going to intermix into the European population and change the complexion of many Europeans, intermix into the European bloodline. And one of the things they're going to do, especially like the Spanish, when they set up their colonies, one of the things they're going to do is, is forbid intermixing with, uh, especially in the Spanish colonies, they forbid intermixing between uh, the races. And the, the, the Spanish are, are going to forbid uh, uh, the, the when they conquer the slaves, when they enslave people and take them into these colonies, they're going to forbid them to uh, learn to read and write also. Well, it's the Moors that taught a lot of the Spanish to, to read and write. All this stuff comes back to kick us in the behind. So we deal with all of this history. And then in the second class, um, we deal with um, history from 1803 through 1968. Okay. And that's a deep class here also. We had a good session today. We dealt with uh, the Reconstruction era. Uh, and with Reconstruction, Reconstruction is a period of history that is not talked about a lot, okay? Reconstruction is directly related to what's going on today. The political violence that we see, the voter suppression laws that we see. Uh, I talked about this article here in class today. This is from Time Magazine, because like I said, I monitor about 35 different news sources on a daily basis, so I pull uh articles from all different news sources national geographic time magazine washington post new york times um uh, everything nbc news um all, all, all different types of sources this article right here came out june uh january uh 12 2021 uh, january 12 2022 i should say this is one year, six months after the January 6th, 2021 insurrection. This article helps to bring all this stuff to get, connect all this together. This is something I've been talking about. This is related to the meeting that President Joe Biden had with uh, historians on August 4th. And it dealt with how uh, these historians are telling President Joe Biden, he's, they're warning him that America's democracy is teetering and they're talking about what leads up. They're talking about the lead, the years that lead up to the 1860 presidential election that Lincoln won and what leads up to the civil war taking place. Well, if we look at this article here, this deals with reconstruction. 
1865 to 1877 and how the reconstruction era is not properly taught in schools across the country okay uh 45 states and let me pull up this uh briefly here i'm going to pull up the presentation that we use class for um from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 okay let's close some of this other stuff out a new report finds that 45 states are failing to teach students about the period that shaped race relations after the civil war okay this deals with the reconstruction era it draws a direct relationship between that history and the political violence we saw january 6 2021 one of the foremost authorities on uh the reconstruction era era is eric foner historian and pulitzer prize winning uh author eric foner author of the book reconstruction america's unfinished revolution 1863 to 1877 now he said in the interview a week after the january 6 2021 insurrection uh interview with new yorker magazine um the article starts out and says in the aftermath of the insurrection a year ago at the u.s capitol many leading historians drew parallels between the violence that we saw january 6 2021 and the reconstruction era the period of political revolution directly following the u.s civil war which is 1861-1875 historian eric foner said quote the events we saw reminded me very much of the reconstruction era and the overthrow of reconstruction and the overthrow of reconstruction which was a which was often accompanied or accomplished i should say by violent assaults on elected officials by violent assaults on elected officials the difference is you didn't have a sitting president sending domestic terrorists to storm the u.s capitol building like you did january 6 2021 Now, scholars say studying the aftermath of the Civil War, which is the Reconstruction era, can put in context many of the seminal events in the U.S. in recent years. From the brutal murder of George Floyd by police in 2021 to the voter suppression laws enacted after African-American voters played a big role in helping Joe Biden and Kamala Harris be elected president and vice president. OK, and that's reminiscent. So it starts out in Georgia with Senate Bill 202 crafted by Heritage Action for America and Jessica Anderson, who's the executive director of, of uh, Heritage Action for America, which is the sister organization to the Heritage Foundation. It's going to be Paul Wayrick, who Paul Wayrick, who's a co-founder of the Heritage Foundation, but also Alec, American Legislative Exchange Council, is going to be is it, going to be Paul Wayrick and jerry falwell in 1980 who create this whole religious right movement which leads to 40 years which leads to about 42 years later overturning roe versus wade the seeds of that goes back to 1980 and paul wayrick and jerry falwell but despite the timeliness of the era in today's climate many students in american schools would not get a full education on the reconstruction period uh, until they go to college but most of them go to college in social studies standards for 45 out of 50 states and the district of columbia discussion of reconstruction is partial or non-existent discussion of reconstruction is partial or non-existent according to historians who have reviewed how the period is discussed in k-12 studies uh study standards for public schools nationwide now this 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 basically is before the critical rate these anti-critical race theory laws start popping up it was partial or non-existent basically before those laws because the anti-critical race theory laws are so vague in many states is creating fear and anxiety amongst teachers so they're confused on what they can teach so they're less likely to really dig into and teach the history of slavery and jim crow segregation and white supremacy and racism things like this because they don't want to get fired from the job understandably so 
they don't want to be sued understandably so a lot of these laws are so vague they're confused on what they can and can't teach now in a report produced by the education nonprofit the zen education project the and we use some of their articles in our classes the study's authors say they are concerned that american children will grow up to be uninformed about a critical period of history that helps to explain why full racial equality remains unfulfilled today. This is what's going on today is directly related to what happened during Reconstruction, the overthrow of Reconstruction, the compromise of 1877 between the Democrats and Republicans where uh, neither one, Rutherford B. Hayes or Samuel J. Tilden had enough uh, electoral college votes to become president. The, uh, they cut a backroom deal. The Republicans say you let Rutherford B. Hayes become president he'll remove the remaining union troops out of the south to allow the the southern segregationists to take back full control of the southern government state and local governments and this is what happens okay then they're going to impose poll taxes starting with florida in 1889 now look at what's going on in florida see florida needs to be desanitized you got governor ron DeSantis in florida florida needs to be desanitized for re-election he needs to be defeated okay November 2022 elections have consequences these elections have deadly results so uh, if if uh, if uh, Andrew Gillum was governor of Florida especially during COVID-19 I guarantee you he would have saved a lot more night lives he would have been more prudent he would have followed the science he would he 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 would not have been so cavalier in handling COVID. He would have shut down the school sooner. He would have saved a lot. He would have saved thousands of people's lives. He would have saved thousands of people's lives, including African American lives. But you had Ron De Satan as governor, anti-science, don't say gay bill. Ron De Satan. So Florida needs to be desanitized. The Mississippi plan to keep blacks from voting in 1890. The Mississippi plan to keep blacks from voting in 1890. We came here to exclude the Negro. So after you have the overthrow of Reconstruction, then you have like in uh, about 1881, the Tennessee State Legislature, they're going to pass laws to segregate streetcars and, and uh, uh, public transportation, things like this. Florida, 1889, passes the first poll taxes. So they charge, you have to pay a tax to register to vote, which will exclude a lot of African-Americans because we couldn't pay the poll tax. What Mississippi did in 1890 became copied by the other Southern states, South Carolina, 1895, Louisiana, 1891, Alabama, 1901, Georgia, North Carolina, things like this. The Mississippi plan to keep blacks from voting in 1890, we came here to exclude the Negro. Now, this is a direct quote from Solomon Saladin Calhoun, who was the white county judge who presided over the Mississippi State Convention. And he said, uh, let's tell the truth. Uh, when it came to why they were there, he put the voting issue bluntly. He said, let's tell the truth. If it burst the bottom of the universe, he said. He said, quote, we came here to exclude the Negro. Nothing short of this will answer. We, this is a direct quote. This is how devious these people were. African-Americans were the majority of the voters in Mississippi. They purposely rewrote the state constitution to impose poll taxes and literacy tests to suppress the African-American vote, which is, which is exactly why you had to have a voting rights act in 1965 so when we look at so we deal with all this in this 10 week online class that i teach on sundays normally sundays 2 p.m to 4 p.m from the civil war to the civil rights movement in black power 1865 to 1868 now i've been studying history 30 years i'm the one to put together all this content for both classes this is a hell of a lot of work okay because the the first class that i teach the one on saturdays that i started teaching that class in 2017 it evolved out of a four and a half hour lecture that i did in 2014 
called Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa Understand the Transatlantic Slave Trade. That lecture was the culmination of seven years of research. And then over time that developed into an online course and it's exploded into what it is today. But I had so much information and I wanted to focus in on this, this second period of history because there's so much is so much going on from uh, 1803 with the Haitian Revolution and the Louisiana Purchase. It's so much going on from 1803 to 1968, just that period of history. And we really need to go deep into that and analyze what happened. That I had to create a second. I couldn't get all that information into the first class. I had to create a second class so we can get deep into this history. OK, so what happens is, is that delegates eventually adopted a literacy test and poll tax geared to suppress the black vote in a state with a black majority. Mississippi had an African-American majority. When you look at South Carolina, the majority uh, and, and during Reconstruction, there, there were 2000 approximately African-American men who got elected to public office nationwide. And 90 percent of African-Americans were in the South. OK, even up until 1910, five years before the Great Migration begins, 90 percent of African-Americans are in the South. The Mississippi plan became the model throughout the South, part of a raft of racially oppressive Jim Crow laws that ends Reconstruction. So the other Southern states adopt what Mississippi did. OK, so if we look at this piece right here and we talked about this in class today from the Zen Education Project. So when you register for this class, you can go watch the entire. We did two hours today. You can go watch the entire class. You can go watch the previous classes because they're all they're all archived. OK, um, if we if we look at this piece right here from the Zen Education Project. How's everybody doing? How y'all like this type of information? You can post, you post your comments here on the thread of the broadcast. Are you learning anything? You like this type of information? Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like. This article here from the Zen Education Project, November 1st, 1890, Mississippi Constitution. OK, now, if you watched Eyes on the Prize and I have the Eyes on the Prize box set, uh, I ordered it from Amazon.com. I have the Eyes on the Prize box set documentary. When they talk about the Voting Rights Act, in 1965 in eyes on the prize they talk about the mississippi state convention of 1890 so it was a uh, they uh, on november 1st 1890 mississippi adopted a new constitution with a poll tax and arbitrary literacy test for voting sections designed to disenfranchise newly franchised african americans and some poor whites the new constitution was a nail in the coffin for mississippi reconstruction and a win for voter suppression it brought an end to the period of democratic progress that followed the civil war when african-americans were the majority of eligible voters in mississippi african-americans were the majority of eligible voters in mississippi and these white supremacists along with the along with a simple simon ass negro named um isaiah t montgomery Isaiah T. Montgomery was the founder of Bayou, Mississippi. He was a former slave to the brother of Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis was from Mississippi and he was the president of the Confederacy. And Isaiah T. Montgomery voted along with these white supremacists to suppress the African-American vote. And, 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 and uh, Frederick Douglass escoriated him, rightfully so. And personally, I don't know this for certain, but I think Isaiah T. Montgomery is a distant relative of Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina, the black, the black Republican Senator who blocked the George Floyd justice and police in that the black Republican Senator who voted against Kristen Clark to be assistant attorney general of the civil rights division of the department of justice, the African-American woman, this Negro voted against her, that, that Tim Scott, I think he's related to Isaiah T Montgomery. If he's not, they're play cousins. If they're not related by blood, they're play cousins. So what happens is, is that the other Southern states do the same thing that Mississippi does. OK, this can be seen in the. So if we, if we go back here, every Southern state instituted literacy tests and poll taxes to effectively remove African-Americans from the citizenship they were supposed to have been guaranteed by the 14th Amendment of 1868. This can be seen in the state constitutions with similar voter suppression statutes. 
adopted by South Carolina, 1895, Louisiana, 1898. Then Louisiana is going to institute the grandfather clause, which states that if your grandfather prior to 1867 could not vote, then you can't vote. Another way to get around the 15th Amendment of 1870. North Carolina, 1900, Alabama, 1901. Alabama still has racist language in their state constitution because there was an Alabama Reconstruction Constitution in 1867 that is going to create a uh, public school system. And during Reconstruction, African-Americans are showing America how to have a democracy. That gets that gets re, that gets overthrown. They come with the Alabama state constitution in 1901 that institutes poll taxes and literacy tests and puts in place segregation. So in Montgomery, Alabama, when they have the Montgomery bus boycott of uh, 1955 that starts Monday morning, December 5th, 1955, people misunderstand the Montgomery bus boycott and think it was about African-Americans want to sit at the front of the bus with white people. No, they wanted to break the back of segregation in Montgomery, Alabama, which was the capital of Alabama, and then eventually destroy segregation in all of Alabama. But segregation is written into the state constitution. So they go to the federal government for help because they knew they couldn't get help at the state government. Because, hell, in 1957, this, in 1957, the, the state legislature in Alabama redrew the district lines in Tuskegee, okay, to uh, lock out almost all of the African-American voters in Tuskegee, Alabama. This leads to a, a, a economic boycott that's four, that's four times as long as the Montgomery bus boycott. The Montgomery bus boycott was 381 days. The, the, the Tuskegee, Alabama economic boycott goes from 1957 to 1961, which leads to the U.S. Supreme Court case of Gomillion versus Lightfoot, because they they sue the state legislature because the state legislature is purposely purposely trying to gerrymander the district to reduce the the political power of african-american voters there in tuskegee alabama this is how devious these people are where their sons and daughters their, their grandchildren are doing the same damn thing in republican state legislatures across the country this is why we got to pull our head out of our asses and connect what's going on today to this history and understand how all this is connected but now they're trying to suppress not just the vote of African-Americans, but Latinos, Asian-Americans, Native Americans, and many white people who vote for Democrats and not Republicans. Because there was Joe Biden and Kamala Harris got 81 million votes. 49 million of those votes, 61 percent came from white people. I know people like to think that the majority of the votes came from African-Americans. No, they didn't. He got 81 million votes. There's only 30 million African-Americans registered to vote. 16.9 million voted. 9.7 million Latinos voted for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. But 49 million white people voted. 61%, more than 50% of his votes came from white people. Okay, so check this out. This is just a fraction of the type of information that we deal with in this class. So give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, give us a like on this broadcast. How you like this type of information? Uh, okay, Ruby, how you doing, Ruby? Okay, so you can register for these online classes. I'm going to post the link here. Now, we have a bundle pack. You can register for both classes for uh, $100, okay? Because normally these classes are $130 each. Uh, we have them discounted, uh, the $30 each. And uh, I'm going to post a link here for the bundle. Uh, uh, post a link here for the bundle pack. As soon as you register, you can start watching content. Or you can go to our new website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and uh, watch them anytime, a year from now, two years from now. You go back and watch the entire class, um, either one of these classes, okay? And you can use this information with your children also. So this is the second class from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. There's a ton of information in this class. And I created the curriculum for this as well. Both of these classes, I created the curriculum. Click right here to register here for the bundle pack. Uh, click right. Uh, we have the information for the bundle. Click right here for the bundle. You get both classes for $100. It's about a 385 value because it's going to be bonus lectures that you get in digital format from me also when you register for this. If you've taken any of my online classes in the past, email me and you'll get a 50% discount. Email me at ahnshow at theafricanhistorynetwork.com or just uh, click right here, contact the African History Network. Just click right there. 
and uh, you can um, email us right through the website. Okay, just uh, contact, just click right there, contact us. All right, um, and this is the some of the slides we do within the second class uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1960. And like I said, we start out with uh, the Louisiana Purchase and the Haitian Revolution and deal with how those two uh, events are related. Okay, right here. We deal with the um, Louisiana Purchase and the Haitian Revolution and how those two events are related. Um, and then we go out through history chronologically, basically year by year and deal with what leads up to the civil war taking place we talk about the missouri compromise of 1820 uh texas revolution 1836 mexican american war 1846 1848 treaty of guadalupe treaty of guadalupe hidalgo 1848 where the u.s gets um california arizona new mexico colorado utah and nevada from uh, Mexico for $15 million. Mexico uses a third, loses about a third of their land. Okay. The Mexican American war, which leads to the treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. We deal with the compromise of 1850, which deals with organizing the land that the U S got from Mexico and the compromise of 1850 includes, it, it, it consists of five bills. And one of those bills, uh, the fifth one is the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which intensifies the abolitionist movement, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Then you have the uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe writing her novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1852, which also intensifies uh, the abolitionist movement and exposes uh, America to the, to the horrors of slavery. It becomes an international bestseller, sells 300,000 copies its first year. It's based upon the autobiography of a real life man named Josiah Henson, who was a slave in Maryland. And he and his family run away from Maryland and go up, uh, go up north and then go into Canada. So Harriet Beecher Stowe reads his autobiography and she, she patterns the fictitious character of Uncle Tom in the novel Uncle Tom's Cat cabin that's patterned after the real life runaway slave josiah henson that talked about in the episode of the jeffersons where uh, uh louise's uh uncle comes to visit um um and um he's paid, played by the same actor who played uh fred c davis on good times and he was uh fred sanford's grady uh cousin grady ball-headed Cousin Grady on Saffron's son. Grady, Grady, you better go join your lady. Remember when uh, Betty Jean comes to visit heavy set Betty Jean and then uh, Lamont's going to marry her because she has a diary. OK, so that 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 uh, that Grady with the bald head who played Fred's cousin, uh, he was on an episode of the Jeffersons and he breaks down the history of Josiah Henson. So we talk about the Kansas, Nebraska Act of 1854. As a result of the Kansas Nebraska Act of 1854, which um, opens up uh, slavery in uh, the Kansas Nebraska territory and leads up to um, people living in those territories to determine whether or not they want to have slavery as opposed to it being dictated by the federal government. This is going to lead to the Republican Party being founded in 1854 as a backlash to the Kansas Nebraska Act. The Republican Party is, is founded largely by groups of abolitionists. And uh, in 1860, their candidate for president, November 1860, Abraham Lincoln, becomes president-elect. Six weeks later, South Carolina secedes from the Union December 20th, 1860, because they think Lincoln's going to free the slaves. They're going to be followed by other uh, uh, other states uh, going into uh, February uh, of uh February and March of 1861, you're going to have the uh, Confederate States of America that's founded right around March of 1861. April 12, 1861, you have the attack on Fort Sumter, which was a federal stronghold, uh, military stronghold in South Carolina. It's attacked because the uh, those in South Carolina are trying to get the Union troops out of the South. And this is what launches the Civil War, the U.S. Civil War, which goes from 1861 to 1865. So we deal with Juneteenth. We deal with the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment. 
One of the things we talked about in class today is how the 15th Amendment, uh, nowhere in the U.S. Constitution does it explicitly give anyone the right to vote. And this article right here from Smithsonian Institute, uh, si.edu, americanhistory.si.edu, which is from the Smithsonian Institute, this article entitled, Does an Amendment Give You the Right to Vote? Okay, does an amendment give you the right to vote? Now, this article came out February 3rd, 2020. And I did a lecture around this time when this article came out. February 3rd, 2020 was the 150th anniversary of the adoption of the 15th Amendment of 1870, which guaranteed the right to vote for African-American men. But nowhere in the U.S. Constitution does it explicitly give anyone the right to vote. And even the 15th Amendment says there are only two sections to the 15th Amendment. Section one says the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Now, section two, so it's saying that you can cannot put impediments in the uh, way of the right to vote. It's guaranteeing the right to vote. But nowhere, as this slide says here, and this comes directly from the article from Smithsonian Institute, as written, the 15th Amendment does not explicitly grant anyone the right to vote. Instead, it prohibits federal and state governments from placing restrictions on voting based on three criteria, race, color, and previous condition of servitude. The entire amendment is two sentences long. Now, the second section of the 15th Amendment of 1870 says the Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Now, prior, now, amendment means to alter or to change. Prior to 1870, what gave people the right to vote? And it was white, largely white men voting. There's nothing in the U.S. Constitution that explicitly gives anyone the right to vote. And then the 19th Amendment of 1920, which guaranteed the right to vote to women, and the 26th Amendment of, the, of 1971 that lowered the minimum age to vote from 21 to 18, the structure of that language in those two amendments is based upon the structure of the language in the 15th Amendment. Now, uh, Justice Antony Scalia, uh, before he died, he actually said that nowhere in the U.S. Constitution does it give anyone the right to vote. He's correct. I despise them, but he's correct. OK, so we deal with this history chronologically. Uh, this is normally a 10 week online course. As soon as you register, uh, we did. Um, class seven today the, the, there's going to be we'll probably have 12 sessions this time around instead of 10 because early on this has been a very very bad allergy season okay those that are, are allergic to pollen know what i'm talking about so early on like the first couple of sessions i had to cut them short because my allergies were killing me i could I, I could only talk 30 minutes 45 minutes the allergies are much better now this is probably the worst allergy season i've seen in the past five to seven years OK, so we're going to probably do 12 sessions. But once again, all the sessions we do live, they're archived. You can watch them anytime. Of course, we talk about the Mississippi State Convention in 1890, right here, Vicksburg Massacre, 1874. We go look at these massacres. You follow Massacre, 1874. You follow Alabama, Vicksburg Massacre, Clinton, Mississippi Massacre, 1875. You have to go look at these massacres because they were attacking African-American voting rights, political violence to intimidate us to keep us from voting. Just like today, just like the attack on uh, the, the U.S. Capitol. And you, you have to understand how devious Trump is. This is why this demon can never become president again, because what he did weeks leading up to the January 6, 2021 insurrection, he targeted four cities that had high African-American populations. And called for, he said that the, the that the votes were illegal, there were fraudulent votes. He called for recounting on the votes. What were those four cities? Detroit, Philadelphia, uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and um, Georgia, a Atlanta, Georgia. He, he targeted these four cities that have a high African American population. Okay, and he incited these white supremacist domestic terrorists. And said that 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 there that, look, I live four minutes away from the TCF Center downtown Detroit. There were Trump supporters outside trying to get inside while the vote counting was going on. I live four minutes away from the TCF Center in downtown Detroit. 
I drove by there. The police had it blocked off. You couldn't even get after a certain time. They had it blocked off. OK, this is what this demon incited. This is why this domestic terrorist can never become. He can never hold political office. His ass belongs in prison. He can never belong. He can never hold political office ever again. OK, Th that cannot happen. Because the second time, they're going to complete the coup. The first time was a dress rehearsal. The second time, they're going to complete the coup. Because now what this demon is doing is putting election deniers in place to be over elections. So Doug Mastriano is running for governor of Pennsylvania. He has to be defeated. Because the governor of Pennsylvania appoints the secretary of state. He already said he's going to support a secretary of state who, who will do, who will overthrow election results and do what Trump wants to do. You got Kerry Lake running for governor of Arizona, another election denier. Another person that must be defeated. This is a continuation of the Civil War and Reconstruction. This, these people are not playing games. They're playing for keeps. We got to get our head out of our asses. Stop listening to negative corporate controlled hip hop that these, that dumbs us down and understand what's really going on. This is a continuation of the Civil War and Reconstruction. And now you got all these armed domestic terrorists. OK, so uh, segregation of public transportation, 1881. This is why I'm for the FBI hunting down every last one of these goddamn domestic terrorists and prosecute them to the full extent for the law. I'm rooting for the FBI. I know they were against Dr. King and all that. No, I'm rooting for the FBI, Merrick Garland, uh, Kristen Clark. I want them to hunt down every last one of these goddamn domestic terrorists who are trying to overthrow the government. They've already arrested 850 and charged them, and they're prosecuting them now. You just had uh, a, uh, a former police officer, former white police officer, who just got convicted. He's getting seven years. Enough, uh, involved involved in the, the, uh, this domestic terrorist, okay? There's another 1,200 of these domestic terrorists that the FBI is looking for. Drop a dime on these people. I'm rooting for the FBI, okay? No, we don't want African Americans unjustly prosecute, uh, persecuted, things like that. I'm rooting for the FBI. If I could join the FBI and hunt down these domestic terrorists, I would do it. Oh, hell no. Because this goes back to why the Department of Justice was created in the first place, going back to 1870 during Reconstruction. Let's take it back to a Reconstruction era. This is how all this history is connected. Okay, the first Attorney General under the Department uh, um, the Department of Justice, 1870, Amos T. Uh, uh, Ackerman, created 150 years ago. The Justice Department's first mission was to protect Black rights. And that's exactly what they're doing today. And the best way to do that is to go after these domestic terrorists. In the wake of the Civil War, the government's new force sought to enshrine equality under the law, July 1st, 2020. Okay, now this caricature here, a cartoon by illustrator Thomas Nast. Thomas Nast is also the illustrator who's going to create the image of what we know as Santa Claus coming from center class. Okay, that's a whole nother conversation. Uh, uh, we talked about that in my class on Saturday. A cartoon by illustrator Thomas Nash shows a member of the White League, which was another domestic terrorist organization because they're involved in the Apollo Massacre of 1874 in Alabama, the, the White League. It wasn't just the Ku Klux Klan. And just because somebody puts on a white sheet and a hood don't mean they're a member of the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan was a fraternal organization. They had bylaws. You had to be, there was an intake process to become a Klan member. So just because somebody wears a white sheet in the hood doesn't mean they're a member of the Klan. A, a cartoon by illustrator Thomas Nast shows a member of the White League and a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Keep in mind, member of the Klan. That's a, that was a fraternal organization originally founded December 24th, 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee. It shows them joining hands over a terrorized black family. OK, and uh, it says here uh, the union as it was. This is a white man's government. The lost cause. Worse than slavery. So the lost cause was this about 150 year 
effort to rewrite the history of the Civil War and teach this revisionist history and, and say that the, the South seceded from the Union for states' rights not to maintain slavery, all this nonsense, okay? Amos T. Ackerman was an unlikely figure to head uh, the newly formed Department of Justice. In 1870, the United States was still working to bind up the nation's wounds, to bind up the nation's wounds torn open by the Civil War. During this period of reconstruction, once again, we, we, we this deals with this period of history, reconstruction. During this period, and where's that article? I got that article here printed. Uh, right, okay. Because I got all these, I have thousands of articles printed. I'm in the process of organizing the office and putting all this, more of this stuff in file folders. I got stacks of articles all over the place. During this period of reconstruction, the federal government committed itself to guaranteeing, check this out, the federal government committed itself to guaranteeing full citizenship, full citizenship rights to all Americans, regardless of race. At the forefront of that effort was Amos T. Ackerman, a former Democrat and enslaver from Georgia, former slave owner from Georgia, and a former officer in the Confederate Army. The United States had an attorney general since the formation of the government in 1789 as as created by the u.s constitution none had been empowered with the full force of a consolidated legal team quite like amos t ackerman and none had the monumental task of enforcing the 14th and 15th amendments and new legislation delivering long overdue rights to four million formerly enslaved uh african-american men and women so the department of justice is formed to enforce these new rights that African Americans have. This is why more of us need to apply to the Department of Justice. And I would say to go after these domestic terrorists, we need to apply to the FBI also. Oh, yes. No, 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 no. We need to apply to the FBI and go after that, hunt down every last one of these domestic terrorists. The, this department's work on behalf of the emancipated population was so central to its early mission that Amos T. Ackerman established the department's headquarters in the Freedman Savings Bank building, because Fre Freedman's Bank uh, created in 1865 by act of Congress as well, to help African Americans save their money uh, that they're making because they're negotiating labor contracts and things like this, because the U.S. Bureau of Freedmen, Refugees, and Abandoned Lands, they're helping African Americans uh, do a number of things. Uh, they provide health care, building schools, um, uh, feeding them, um, but they're also um, helping them uh, put their money in, in the banks also, so the Freedmen's Bank. In the immediate wake of the Civil War, Amos T. Ackerman, a New Hampshireite who settled in Georgia in the 1840s, looked to the future, leaving the Democrats for the Republicans and prosecuting voter intimidation cases, prosecuting voter intimidation cases, as a U.S. district attorney in his adopted state of Georgia, reflecting on his decision to switch his allegiance to the party of Lincoln, Amos T. Ackerman said, quote, some of us who had adhered to who had adhered to the Confederacy felt it to be our duty when we were to participate in the politics of the Union to let the Confederate ideals rule us no longer to let the Confederate ideas rule us no longer. Regarding the subjugation of one race by the other as an appurtenance of slavery, we were content that it should go to the grave in which slavery had been buried. We, we were content that it should go to the grave in which slavery had been buried, okay? Ackerman's work caught the attention of President Ulysses S. Grant, who was former general in the uh, Union Army during the Civil War, who promoted uh, Amos T. Ackerman to Attorney General in June 1870. On, on July 1st, 1870, the Department of Justice created to handle the onslaught of post-Civil War litigation became an official government department with Amos, Amos T. Ackerman at his helm. The focus of his 18-month tenure as the nation's top law enforcement official was the protection of black voting rights from
from the from the systematic violence of the Ku Klux Klan. OK, this is the focus of the first 18 months of the Department of Justice when it comes into existence in 1870. To the protection of black voting rights from the systematic violence of the Klan and other Klan like organizations. We added that like the White League. Ackerman's Justice Department prosecuted and chased from southern states hundreds of Klan members. Today, the Justice Department is prosecuting many of their descendants who are the domestic terrorists who stormed the U.S. Capitol building January 6, 2021. We need to apply the Department of Justice and hunt down every last one of these traitors in the, in the, in the tradition of the Department of Justice. Take it back to the old school. In the tradition of the Department of Justice, go after all these coup plotters. Historian William McFeely, in his biography on Amos T. Ackerman, wrote, quote, perhaps no attorney general since his tenure has been more vigorous in the, pro in the prosecution of cases designed to protect the lives and rights of black Americans. Take it back to the old school. We need to apply to the Department of Justice. That's why I was cheering when uh uh assistant attorney general of the civil rights division uh our sister kristen clark when when she was confirmed uh by the u.s senate and joe manchin voted against her and so did punk as uh uh senator tim scott black black republican he had no excuse for voting against that sister luckily susan collin the main voted for her, okay and then the tie-breaking vote, I think the tie-breaker was Vice President Kamala Harris. So I think it was 51-50, that vote, okay? You don't get a Kristen Clark as a, a assistant attorney general as the Civil Rights Division without voting. That's how, she, that's how she became that. You don't get a Merrick Garland. You don't get them prosecuting these four officers involved in killing Breonna Taylor without voting. Um, this one here, where is that? Uh, where is that? Uh, we've got that graphic that I created. Uh, okay, it's AHN show. And this one here should be Brianna Taylor. This right here. Let me pull this graphic up here. This is from our show from uh, last Sunday. We talked about this in Roland Martin Unfiltered. Breonna Taylor update four officers charged in the Department of Justice and her killing after 874 days. That's the result of voting. You don't get those charges from the federal government because the Trump administration was not going to charge them. And the Trump administration backed off of holding police officers accountable and they backed off of the investigation into the patterns and practices of police departments. Because it was April of 2021 that the that the Merrick Garland uh, uh, Justice Department launched a pattern and practice investigation into the Louisville uh, Metropolitan Police Department. You don't get that without voting. And this is Assistant Attorney General of the Civil Rights Division, Kristen Clark. You don't get her without voting. All right. So. How's everybody doing? Hope you like this type of information. Please register for these online courses. This helps support the African History Network. This helps us finance the research that I do, help support the African History Network show, help us pay some of the bills, etc. Okay, so you can visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, or you can register for the classes. Now, as soon as you register, you start watching the content. You don't have to wait till the next class. We have archived content. You can start watching to watch the classes we did uh, this weekend. And the, the, the best uh, uh, value is the bundle pack. You get both classes for $100, okay? You get both classes for $100. So we got the information uh, right here uh, at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. This really, really helps us because there's so many things that I want to do. I got to buy new equipment. It's, I want to take this to the next level, uh, but I can't. It, it, it costs money to do all that. So <laughs> this it is what it is. All right. So we'll put, so we have the link here in the thread of the broadcast. You can go to um, our new website, the African history network.com. I built a new website. It costs, it costs money to, to do that as well. I, I think I had to pay like $180 because with WordPress, they wanted me to pay all. See with one and one, I could pay each month. WordPress wanted me to pay all the money up front. 
So I had to pay like $180 to be able to build a new website and I'm still adding to it. So all this stuff here, uh, this stuff ain't easy. I'm telling you right now. Okay, I guess maybe I'll make it look easy. <laughs> no, this stuff is not easy. All right. So this is our new website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. And um, you can go there and we have the link here in the thread of the broadcast also. So you can register for the classes. The content I would say is PG-13. You can use this with your children. And we're getting into selling children's books also. OK, this is another reason why I'm trying to expand because uh, I ordered some children's books. We sold it. I got to restock uh, books for African-American children and deal with positive self-esteem, teach them love themselves, teaching them history, things like this. So we're expanding. Um, uh, we still sell some DVDs. I'm shifting. I'm going to start. Uh, we're shifting more to digital format. We'll still sell some DVDs, but I'm also getting into selling books as well. And I'm working on writing my first book also. So I have 60 pages of my first book written. I'm hopefully. Uh, that's gonna cost money to get that published hopefully um we'll get that out in september 2022 because it's going to deal with uh midterm elections also okay so we posted the link here as well and we have it in thread of the broadcast all right uh we got to get out of here uh and then cash app paypal information is at our website we have to get out of here remember at the african history network we focus on educating and empowering and inspiring people of african descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior it's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. Hotep, everybody. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, writer, and historian. And I want to give a special shout out to everybody who has attended the 11th annual Liberated Minds Black Homeschool and Education Expo. I just want to take a few minutes. And uh, we had a great presentation that I did uh, on Saturday. So I teach two online history classes uh one on saturday and uh one on sunday on saturday the class that i teach normally 2 p.m to 4 p.m eastern standard time is called ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school and this is normally a 10-week online class we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place we can't start studying our history and slavery even when we study the transatlantic slave trade which is important to study we can't start in 1619 or in the 1440s with the portuguese when the portuguese get involved in the transatlantic slave trade we have to understand the history chronologically and deal with the 800 year occupation of europe by the africans known as the moors who enter into the iberian peninsula today known as spain and portugal from north africa in 711 a.d when we discuss the transatlantic slave trade we have to first understand that african people are the original people of north central and south america and have been in the land we call the united states at least 51,700 years. Now, the second class I teach is on Sundays, normally 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's called uh, From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Now, these classes are normally $130. They're on sale right now, $60. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded, so you can go back and watch it any time. So a year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire class. With both of these classes, I would say the content is PG-13, so you can use this with your children as well if you want to. Um, also, you can advertise with the African History Network. We have three new advertising packages. Our current promotion is buy one month to get one month free. We have a million followers at our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. And with our platinum package, um, we'll take our ads on our Facebook fan page uh, for you as well to um, help maximize your advertising campaign. And we take your 30 second and 60 second commercial we put into the rebroadcast uh, of our shows and also into the audio podcast of our shows as well uh we only have 20 advertising slots because we have a finite amount of advertising space uh email us at ahn show at the african history network.com ahn show at the african history network.com or call us 313-462-0003 all right right now is correct wrong behavior is not over till we win wakanda forever and we'll talk to you soon